continuing our series on knowing the enemy. And so I've said before, we're going to spend a lot of time in 1 Peter. This passage will sound very familiar. Uh, also, uh, Ephesians 6, about the armor of God, where we keep seeing some of these over and over. But uh, tonight, I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Familiar passage of Scripture. We've already seen it several times. First Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 8, says this, uh, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you, per make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. I don't know if you're one that marks in your Bible or, or underlines things or whatever, but here are some things I wanted to point out uh, starting in verse 8. All these words... I kind of have something in common. You can kind of see this theme here, but be sober, be vigilant. Uh, both of those words pretty much mean to watch, you know, to be, uh, to be watching and, and ready. And then uh, uh, verse 9, whom resist steadfast. Okay, both of those have to do with standing and, uh, and resisting the enemy. I, I read... Uh, uh, from the dictionary, the 1828 dictionary, which I like to go to, and, and uh, it uses scripture a lot of times to, to give an example of what the word means. And it said something I found interesting. It said uh, a mountain or a, or a dam or, so, or something like that will resist a current by just standing still. But it said, uh, it's, but then it's, it made reference to an army, and it said an army will resist the enemy by basically by being aggressive, aggressive and, and moving forward. And, 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 we're, and I got to thinking about that, that really, uh, if we stand, Brayden, uh, I didn't warn you ahead of time, but come here for a minute. If, if, if we are to just stand, I mean, just stand. As, as hard as you can stand, just stand. And then the enemy comes... <laughs> You know, you, you can stand as much as you can, but, but you know, you're, you're not stable. You're not uh, settled, right, which is what the, the end of this, this passage said. So actually, in order for him to resist me, if I'm going to do that, like, you know, I think about football. You know they're coming. You know they're going to attack, attack. So you're not just going to stand like this, but you're actually going to be moving forward, and you're ready to embrace that impact by, by pushing forward, right? That's kind of a, an interesting thing. So, so if I were to push them now and, and you were trying to come forward at me while I'm pushing you, that's a lot harder to do, right? <laughs> so I think you can sit down. So maybe there's a little difference between just standing and actually standing with a sober mind and, and, and being steadfast and wanting to resist uh, the enemy. And so it says resist, be steadfast. In the faith, okay, that's, of course, the, the, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual things and, and power. So, so, uh, so it's by faith is what we're standing in. Uh, number, and then uh, verse 10, establish. It says uh, at the end of there, he'll, that after you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Establish means, I mean, if you really think about the way that word's spelled, it, it means basically to stable, make stable, stabilize, all right? So to stable you, to strengthen you, to settle you, these are all uh, kind of the, talking about the same thing. There's a lot of S's there, but I didn't try to do any kind of, <laughs> oh, what do you call that? I didn't make an acronym or anything, but, uh, but these words have a lot to do uh, with fighting the fight and being defensive. And, uh, and so I think about, I'm going I'm to use boxing as an illustration. The same would apply, I guess, in, in sword fighting, although I've never really done the sword fighting uh, much. But, but if you are to constantly be on the guard and constantly 
defend yourself. In fact, they teach you in boxing to always keep your guard up. And so you're like this, and you're blocking, you're watching, right? Uh, being constantly aware, you're looking for signs. Sometimes their shoulder will begin to move, and you know they're fixing to punch you or whatever. Constantly on the guard. And, uh, and a good fighter, same thing would be for, you know, a sword fighter or something like that. You're always watching all the things, and you're, most of the fight is defensive. You're just waiting, okay? And, and, and with enough patience and constantly being uh, mindful and watching, you know, uh, uh, after a while, you get tired of blocking all these and watching. But eventually, your opponent will leave an opening. He'll drop his guard, you know, or you'll, you'll realize that whenever they're punching you, they're leaving a, a hole open so that you can counter, counter strike. I mean, forgive me for the boxing illustration, but that's all I could think about. But, but this is very much the case. So a war or any kind of battle or fight is going to be very much defensive, but it's always going to be looking for that hole, if you will, looking for someone to drop your guard. And I'm going to tell you this. You probably aren't going to be able to outpatience, if that's even a word, I, don't, I guess it's not. <laughs> you probably aren't going to be able to have more patience than the devil. He's been around a while. <laughs> he knows how to wait. You know, uh, uh, I, I think about this, uh, I'm not calling Muslims the devil necessarily, but, but uh, uh, I remember hearing about, you know, when we first went, started get, getting involved in the, uh, uh, fighting a battle against terrorism in the Middle East and and I remember, I, uh, I, think, I think it was whenever George, George W. was in and he said, this is going to be a long war. Because Middle Eastern uh, thinking, and this is true, this is true in almost everywhere except for the United States, really. Uh, whether it's Africa or uh, um, China or, or the Middle East, but, but their thinking oftentimes is, is for the long haul. You know, we will raise generations of people. I mean, communism, from what I understand, was kind of that way a long time ago in Germany and, and this whole mindset, hey, we're going to get into the schools, right? You've heard that said, we're going to, we're going to wait this thing out and future generations then will win the battle. We want everything now. You know, we want to get it, we want to get this thing over with now. Let's just blow them all up and let God sort out. <laughs> but they are willing to just wait. Raise generations, you know, they're not so concerned about what happens in their lifetime, uh, but down. And I kind of feel like Satan's like that. You know, he just, he'll wait. He'll keep on sending the little fiery darts, and we'll keep trying to block them with the shield of faith, and we'll keep doing it. We're fighting, fighting, we're guarding, guarding, and then he's just waiting for that one time when we drop our guard. And then just, whew, you know, he's going to get us out for again. So what I want to talk about tonight is letting down our guard. We have an enemy that's very patient and is waiting for the right time to strike. If, our, uh, if, if he can just outpatience us, you know, you think about a, a boxing match. Again, there, uh, if, you, if you've watched much boxing, a lot of times very little happens until later in, in the fight. And that last round, it seems like people get sloppy and then there's, there's, you know, that's when all the action happens. At first, it's just a defensive game. Everybody's just blocking and it seems like, come on, this is boring. Nothing's happening. Get some, get some action in there until the very end it starts happening. Well, uh, well I, I believe Satan really wants us to drop our guard so that he can get that attack in. And, uh, and I just felt like, um, you know, where to go with this, me where, where to go with this series. I just felt like it was time to preach this message about not letting our guard down. And I realized a lot of it could be preaching to myself. You realize sometimes that happens and I'm realizing what I need. And so I'll, I'll say that, but I, I believe maybe this will help somebody and maybe we can just strengthen each other with this idea. There's some things that we need to make sure as a church we don't let our guard down. It can be really easy to do. And uh, so here's just a few things that I wanted to mention tonight. A different kind of message than what I prefer to preach. I usually preach, uh, but I've got a few things that are on my mind uh, that maybe we can talk about. We'll see kind of where it goes. <laughs> The church, our church, 
we must not let down our guard in the following areas. Turn to uh, Acts chapter 2. It gets real easy to get tired and drop our guard or to get distracted on things that, that aren't key issues uh, and, and to drop our guard there. It gets real easy uh, sometimes after we have, have been on the offense. You think about, like, like I said, sometimes when somebody goes to, uh, uh, to throw in that jab, they leave themselves wide open and the enemy has a... Well, sometimes it's like that as a church. It seems like we do something on the offensive. I think about vacation Bible school and the effort that went into it and all. And you're, We made an attempt to do something for the Lord. Well, it could very well be that in, in making that attempt, we leave our guard open and Satan begins to attack. I mean, I'm not going to try to make all these applications about uh, where we are in terms of right after VBS or whatever, but, but that's what's on my mind right now. Uh, we can't let our guard down in, in this area, and that is remembering our mission. I haven't done it yet, but I plan on having uh, uh, one day where where the roof of the ark is, <laughs> have the worship, fellowship, and discipleship, which I have kind of made the uh, mission statement, if you will, which I think is very biblical for a church's uh, mission statement, and that to worship. You say, well, what is, our, what is our job as a church? Well, clearly our job is to reach souls. We know that. But if that's all the church decides, hey, well, here's what we need to do. We just need to win souls. And that's all we're about is just is knocking on doors, giving the gospel, whatever. That's great. But there's a lot of other things that we might not be doing, right? The Bible says one of the main things as a church we're supposed to be doing is praying and worshiping the Lord and serving Him and giving Him the glory for all things, even, even in rough times or whatever, but, but, but giving Him the worship. One thing as a church we need to be doing is fellowshipping. You know, I love the opportunities when we get together to, uh, to fellowship and we'll, we'll, we'll try to give these little opportunities. Uh, we were, my wife and I were just talking today about how when we started doing the, uh, the and I'm, I'm not, certainly not trying to get on anybody or say you need to do more of this or whatever, uh, but, uh, but I'm just breaking my heart. But when we started doing the uh, refreshments before Sunday school, I thought, you know, is that silly? Is anybody going to want to do that? Just serve some little snacks over there. And, and Valerie and I got to talking this afternoon about how uh, Miss Mary Lee just kind of stepped up and, and, and started heading that over there. She's always there, always making sure people get, uh, get food. She probably gives away too much because she lets little kids come and eat it. And <laughs> but, uh, but, and, and we were talking about how, how nice it is. Even my kids, that time has become a sweet time of sitting down, talking about things that are on our lives. Uh, you know, people who are suffering, having problems. I know there's been many times Miss uh, Ruth has come in and sat down and just talked to Miss Mary Lee or whoever uh, uh, comes together. We, we share burdens with each other. And we th now, I don't know why food has to be involved, but maybe it's a Baptist thing. If, if we're going to fellowship, we got to fellowship with food, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but we get together, and we're just there as a church family, you know, and we're, and we're sharing with each other. Fellowship is super important to a church. And then, of course, discipleship. Yes, go ye into all the world. We need to, uh, here, here, here's what I've got for discipleship. Discipleship is about us growing, first of all. We need to constantly be growing. No matter how old we are, no matter how long we've been at this, we need to be growing. But we also need to be going out and getting other people to come in and grow with us, right? So that's the idea. Uh, discipleship. We can include evangelism in that. We've got to go give the gospel. We've got to bring people into the church. But then we've got to help them to grow. They're going to have to see in our, from our lifestyle or see uh, from us sitting down and talking to them about the Word of God or through listening to messages together or whatever to, uh, to, to grow together as a family. So there's, so there's worship and there's fellowship and discipleship. You know how easy it would be to just forget that this is what we're here for. <laughs> And we get distracted on some other things, and it's almost like, well, what are we here? we got to keep reminding ourselves. If, if, and to me, it's almost like that's our offensive. Okay, so it would be like if I'm in a boxing ring, back to the boxing illustration, and I'm sitting there putting my guard up, and my opponent's punching, 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 and I'm not throwing any strikes. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just, the whole fight is just me like this. You know, what am I even there for? 
Uh, many of you might not know this, but, but right around the time I was getting engaged to Val, well, actually shortly before we got married, uh, I started boxing. I was in uh, uh, Springfield, Missouri, and I, was, and I was at Bible college there, and I was running one day going for a jog, and I came across this boxing gym. And I said, oh, you know, I think that would be a good form of exercise and kind of fun. And after all, my name's Rocky, right? So it's kind of, it kind of fits. And so I, I talked to the trainer in there, and we worked some things out, and I paid a little bit of money, and I, he let me come in every day and train. He'd work with me sometimes or whatever. And Valerie... Uh, found out about this, <laughs> said, boxing? And she said this, why would anybody want to be a punching bag for somebody else? And I said, you missed the whole point of boxing. <laughs> You're right. Why would anybody want to just stand in the ring and, oh, no, no, this is going to hurt. Oh, this is going to hurt and just take punches all day. But that's not the point. The point is you want to wait for that time to give them the punch, right? <laughs> and so, so uh, what would be the point of getting in the ring if all you're doing is just taking punches? Yeah, nobody would want to do that. But we're in a fight, and so we got a job to do. And so if we're just putting up our guard all the time and we're letting Satan just beat on us, but we're not doing what God called us to do, then that would be a, a, a real shame. And so what we've got to do is constantly remind ourselves we need to be constantly worshiping the Lord every chance we get, we need to be in prayer and in, in praising him. We need to be fellowshipping with the believers. And we need to be uh, discipling people. So let's look at some scriptures. I had you turn to Acts 2. Acts 2, verse 41. Uh, the book of Acts. I'm not saying we have to do everything in the church the same way that they did in the book of Acts. But it's a great example for us and kind of a model uh, for, uh, for you know, reminding us how church is supposed to be. And so verse 42 says this, it's right after Peter preaches uh, this message on the day of Pentecost, and it says, uh, they that gladly received his word, that's verse 41, uh, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in, uh, the, I, like, I didn't think about this, but there's that word again, steadfastly. Uh, unmovable, that's, that's what it means, uh, immovable. Immov and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which, was God, which is God's doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together, and had all things common. And you see this picture of, of, of a, just a wonderful church, just sharing. A lot of people say, oh, see, socialism, they had all things in common. Well, no, it's good to share. <laughs> you know, it's good to have all things in common. It's just, uh, it's not socialism because it's not the government saying, you know, <laughs> you got, here, you've got to share with everybody. Okay, so, but it's a good thing. They had all things in common. Uh, you know, there's this almost a, of a community atmosphere. I'm not saying we all got to move in a, a compound somewhere. That'd be a little creepy. But <laughs> we have to, as a church, be together. And have things in common and share with one another. And, and, uh, and I love that about our fellowshipping time. I love people bringing produce uh, from their gardens and sharing that stuff. Uh, newspaper articles. Brother Webb gave me a, a, a CD today to listen to from a preacher. And, uh, and, and, and sharing and, and just being involved with one another. We've got to do that, okay? Uh, so now let's look at this, ch uh, chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Also, verse 42 says this, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. I've kind of adopted that as a theme verse too for our church. Is, is, uh, what I get by this is that something should be going on every day. You know, in the book of Hebrews he says, uh, uh, talking about assembling ourselves together so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I'm afraid so many churches are meeting less and less and having less times to get together. And I think something should be going on every day. And I've, and I've tried to uh, uh, keep things going on. You know, on Tuesdays, we've got visiting uh, the nursing home. Uh, I've tried to uh, say if, if we're on the days that we're not visiting nursing home, we'll make some visits to shut-ins and, and what have you. Wednesdays, of course, we have our Bible study here. And uh, uh, Thursdays, I'm trying to, uh, trying to get regular soul winning at, time, at 5 o'clock meeting and going soul winning. 
Fridays we might have occasional activities, some kind of preaching or some youth activity. I'm saying that's a possibility of, of, of constant things that we're doing around here. Saturdays, uh, we got the cleaning crew comes in and cleans the church, and we got visiting the bus routes and all that stuff. And of course, Sunday's full. Man, every you know, our neighbors should be like, why are cars always in that driveway? <laughs> you know, what's going on at that church there? Something's always being done. Yeah, because we're a church working together, doing what God's called us to do every day for the Lord, okay? And, and I'm not saying you have to, you, each individual has to be here every day, but as a church, I think something should constantly be going on. And so we can't let down our guard and forget what we're here for. Secondly, we can't let our guard down in our personal standards. Man, that's easy to do. And I see myself sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll have this idea like, man, I'm going to be real careful. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm going to stop watching this kind of stuff on TV or or um, whatever it is you can think of that is your is your standard. And you and you have this standard. And then after a while, you just drop your guard and you start allowing yourself to uh, to watch. things. So I wrote these things down. Uh, I think that too many preachers, myself included, shy away sometimes from, from preaching on standards. And I understand where that comes from because when you tell somebody that, hey, this is how you ought to be living, then inevitably they feel like what you're saying is you're not living good. And so they immediately, you're judging me. And you might not be saying anything about them. You're just saying this is what the standard is. This is what we should be striving to be. And they line themselves up with that standard that you're, you're presenting. And they say, hey, I don't line up with that. And so instead of saying, I'm going to start making progress towards that standard, they'll just say, oh, you're judging me. So what, should we lower all of the standards and just find the, you know, the, the person out there with the lower standards and we all have that as a standard? No, our standards should always be high. I was just telling someone the other day, uh, uh, when I was a, a kid, you know, we had barely as a family, ba- hardly been going to church for any length of time. And, uh, and so my parents, you know, they hadn't established a whole lot of personal standards and convictions and as far as what the way that we dressed at our house or what music we listened to, what we watched on TV, what kind of language we used. I remember the first time my dad got up and preached uh, at a, like a preacher's meeting and he said, uh, uh, now my kid, to my kids, this is a cuss word. I'm not cussing. I'm just, but he said, darn, while he was, while he was preaching and, uh, didn't think anything of it. But when he got done, the preacher said, you know, you ought to try not to use the kind of euphemism. I had never heard that before. Well, he didn't cuss. <laughs> you know, that's not a cuss word. Oh, well, now here I am many years later and I teach my kids, no, 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 don't say that. You know, that's a euphemism for a bad word. And, 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 and so, you know, now I, my kids, I remember when they were in Sunday school here one time, they said, uh, uh, they said Dad, I got to tell you something. My Sunday school teacher cussed. I said, what? What did they say? I don't even want to say it. No, well, I just want you to tell me so that I can know. They said, OMG. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I, I don't want to make light of that, but they've, they've been taught, you know, that a standard. And so just because, you know, not everybody has the same standard, I realize that, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't make standards. And I think it's real easy as a church to say, well, we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, so we don't want to talk about these certain things, or, or uh, 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 you know, I, I, I bring this up, you know, we don't preach on this a whole lot, but I bring up this, the, clothing, the clothing issue, all right? And everybody knows my wife and my daughter, they always wear dresses and they always wear skirts, and, uh, and I know that's not the standard for everybody. But here is the thing, if I was to, if I was to say, Use it your imagination. Uh, what is the the most in terms of, of of clothing? All right. What is the most? Uh, let's see. The least decent thing somebody could wear, right? Because there's basically three areas of clothing. I think you ought to be decent. You know, cover yourself. Modest in the sense of uh, this is the way I use the word modest. I think this is the right way. Uh, not flashy. Not like overdone. Look at me. Uh, right, and then, uh, and then according to your gender, I think is biblically a very important uh, aspect of the, your clothing that you wear. So if you were to say, what is, what is the, the bottom of all those three? You could picture something in your mind, <laughs> all right? And then you say, well, what is the highest standard of somebody who's decent, 
somebody who uh, is not flashy and just look at me. And, some, and I'm not saying that I've got, I know where that exactly is or that we hit it right every time in, in my family. But I'm saying there's nothing wrong with setting a standard high and saying, you don't want to go as far this way as I can. And I, and I got off track a minute ago, but I was saying when I was a little kid and my parents didn't have all the, uh, the standards that they, that they grew into later on, I remember thinking this when I went into church. Why would anybody want to go to a church whose standards were lower than theirs? I mean, I was a little kid, and, I, and we, we didn't have a whole lot of standards. But I remember thinking, like, I want to go somewhere where they're going to constantly be, uh, uh, there's room to grow. You know, <laughs> I guess say, huh, I want, to try to, I want to try to do a little bit more and a little bit more. And, you know, and, and, and the preacher doesn't even own a TV. <gasps> you know, what a radical no, it's not that everybody has to be exactly like him, but he's setting a standard. And we've got to be careful uh, as a church that we don't just let down our personal standards and begin to say, well, they're not important. Everybody else, you know, has lower standards than I do. And so, uh, and so none of this is, is important. No, it's good to have standards. It's good to have, uh, we had a, uh, when we, uh, this morning, uh, I looked out and, and we weren't going to run the van, but uh, I looked out and there are no kids. <laughs> We, I said, I told them, your parents have to bring you. All week long, your parents need to bring you on, on Sunday. And they kept saying, my parents are bringing me. My parents are coming. And uh, if I would have went off of their word, you know, they all would have got here by their parents. But unfortunately, today came and none of their parents brought them. And so I said, I'm just going to go back there and check the answering machine. It's getting ready time to start. We didn't have any kids here. And I listened and maybe I misunderstood, but were you going to run the van today? And I'm thinking... No, I'm not going to run the van. You're supposed to be here. But anyway, and so all I could do is visualize those little girls that came this morning at home going, where's the van? And so I went out and got them, right? And so some of these kids, uh, you know, a few of them actually came dressed today. And don't get me, don't misunderstand me. If we're picking up kids off the street or, or we're inviting folks to come to church and they show up and, it's, and they're not according to these high standards that I'm talking about. No, no, no. I'm not saying well, you can't come in here because you don't have a high standard. What I'm saying is we ought to be setting an example for them to see this is a, this is a, a good standard. You know, this is what you should be working towards. You see what I'm saying? So you may have noticed this morning I had the little girls that held the sign. It just so happened there were two girls that came dressed somewhat modest, even had skirts on. You say, oh, are you a fanatic about that? No, but it's good to have a standard. If you're going to get up on the platform, this is the way you're going to dress. And so I didn't even make a big deal about it, but I picked those girls uh, uh, to stand up here. Well, one of the little girls came and, uh, well, I picked that family up and then I went to go pick up their cousin. And she figured, you know, oh, I guess they're not coming to get me. So she got out of her church clothes and got back into just a short, uh, some short shorts, and I think she had a tank top on, if I remember right. And, uh, and, and whenever I went to, you know, say, where am I going with this? <laughs> when I went to pick her up, she said, the van's here. And so she just ran out like she was. And, she's, and so when she got in, she was like, I just had to run out in what I have because I took my, my church clothes off. And I said, come on, we're glad you're coming, you know, right? But then one of the other kids said this, well, at least you're dressed in something decent. And I thought, well, she... This little girl usually does, by the way, wear church clothes. What she, she was raised to wear, you know, church clothes. I hope you understand what I mean by church clothes, and I'm not, I'm not a, like offense, offending anybody or anything. But she had taken that off and now was wearing something that comparatively was not decent, all right? I didn't make a big deal. I wanted her in church. But, but the, what that girl said was, well, at least she's wearing something decent. And I thought... Where's the line drawn? I mean, at what point? And I'm not kidding. If you go to a public school and they say, okay, here, here's the fingertip rule. You got your fingertips down here, and as far as your fingertips go, that's where your skirt has to go. Well, I don't have super long arms, but that's a short skirt. And if you got short arms, <laughs> you got T-Rex arms, what, what, are you, what are you doing? I don't know what the standard is. Like, like I, I don't think there is a standard is what I'm saying. And they say, well, at least you're, you're modest. What does that mean? You didn't come to church in your underwear? <laughs> what does it mean? At least you're modest. At least you don't have your bathing suit on. And so I don't know. But here's, here's what we do know as a church. The world has no standards. Okay? So when they see a Christian, they come to church, they should see, hey, these people dress differently than I do. These people have a different way of talking. These people have... 
Why? Because we want to be these weird fanatics. And No, it's just because we want to demonstrate to them, uh, uh, I want to say, a higher way of life. And I hope you understand what I mean. I'm not saying that we're better than them. We would all be in the exact same condition. We would all have the same you know, lack of standards had we not been in certain situations, raised uh, in certain places, been in certain churches, heard certain preaching. And so it's not a matter of being better. It's just, you know, the... the God is perfect. <laughs> His word is perfect. The things that he tells us to do in the Bible are perfect. We're never going to meet that standard, but at least we can try to live up to it the best we can. You know, Jesus said, be ye perfect. No, nobody's perfect. Well, yeah, but you ought to be trying to be perfect is the idea there. See? So we can't let our guard down in personal standards. And, uh, and as, a, as, a, as the pastor, that's something that I've struggled with because I want to set a high standard. I want there to be some kind of regulations. You know, the church camp that we go to has some strict rules. And sometimes I feel uncomfortable telling, oh, if you're going to come, uh, you're going to come to our camp, then these are the guidelines that you have to follow, and you need to wear this, and you need to wear, wear that. And as a pastor, I want them to come. I don't want them to feel like Brother Rocky's this crazy guy that's judging me and all this stuff. But no, it's not that. It's that we want to set a standard. And what I found that most of the time, kids, they don't know. I didn't whenever I was little. If I went to camp and they said, hey, you, you, you know, you're not going to bring any shorts. You're just going to wear pants. I never asked, well, why? Well, that doesn't make sense. And now when you go to camp, that's the questions that are being asked. But, but I, I never did that. It was, just, it, it was just, hey, this is the standard that we're setting. Maybe you don't dress that way at home or whatever, but it gives you something to, uh, 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 to, to shoot for, okay? So well, I don't think uh, we need to be careful as a church not to let down our guard. I didn't mean to go, uh, go so far at, uh, on that issue as I did, but we need to be careful not to let our guard down on personal standards and start thinking, well, it doesn't really matter. Okay, even as, even as a pastor, I've realized that when I'm knocking on doors, and talking to people in the community, they respond better when I'm not dressed like this. Does that make sense? Because when I'm dressed like this, what are you, social service? Are you going to come take my kids away? Or, you know, what are you, some kind of, you know, businessman? Whoa, you, and, and they, they, there's this wall built. And so I've actually found out if I dress a little more casual, then, uh, then they're a little more accepting of me. And one time I hadn't shaved you know, my, I, was, I was looking kind of scruffy, uh, which I'm not against beards, but I looked rough, like keep your kids away from this guy rough. <laughs> and I had some, uh, uh, I think I was mowing or something like that, so I had a t-shirt on that was, was all messed up and some jeans, probably had a hole in the knee or something like that. And I went to the gas station, I think I had Zachary with me, we got some Gatorade or something like that, and I ran into somebody that hadn't been to church for a long time. And, and we got to talk, and I was like, hey, how you been, all this kind of stuff. And I looked down, and I said, I'm sorry for the way I'm dressed. And, and, and I don't remember how she said it, but it was almost like, well, you look just like me. I'm comfortable with this. You know what I mean? And, 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 and don't get me wrong. There's something good about that. There's something about being all things to all people. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, kind of living in their culture, so to speak. But what's wrong with having higher standards, you know? What's wrong with saying, hey, this guy's dressed like a preacher. This guy's dressed like, uh, standards are good. So anyway, I kind of got off on that situation. But what I'm saying is, is uh, even as a pastor, I sometimes think, well, where is that? Like, I struggle with, where is that thing? I don't have a jacket on tonight. You know, there's some preachers that would be like, oh, you're going liberal. You don't have a jacket on while you're preaching. Now, I think that's kind of silly. But if they made a standard for that and they said, hey, if a preacher's going to get up here and preach or if someone's going to get on the platform, they have a jacket on, more power to you. If I go preach at your church, I'm going to wear a jacket. I'm not going to complain about your, your regulations. Okay, man, I keep getting off on that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a reason. <laughs> okay, so we can't let our guard down on that. We can't let our guard down on, uh, 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 okay, back to personal standards, the music that we listen to. This, uh, you know, in our house... We had uh, pretty high standards for our kids as far as you're not going to listen to that kind of music. You know, it's, it's interesting. I hope you don't mind if I get, uh, this might be a little bit, go a little bit longer than I meant to, but music is an interesting thing, all right? And our society is, so, is right now so music-driven. We were at Walmart uh, the other day, what, yesterday, 
And, uh, and a lady was listening to this heavy metal, just, I mean, just screaming heavy metal coming out of her phone on her shopping cart. And, uh, and, and, and she, she asked us to help her with, she was getting some school supplies and, and everything. And, and so Valerie started helping her find stuff and finding the right, right thing. And I'm just looking at this phone like, you gonna shut that off? I mean, it was just like, that's disturbing. Just like, rah, 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 rah. And I thought just, con- she didn't even know it's on. It's just constantly, all day long, this kind of stuff is getting in her head. And you don't think that affects them? It does affect them. And, 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 when, and, and our kids, when they, were, when they were infants, we would go flip through the radio station. And there's certain uh, uh, music that would affect them in a certain way. And they would be, you know, dancing to it or whatever and, and, and making all this noise. And then another one would be more calming. I mean, I'm not going to go overboard on this right now, but, uh, but music affects you. Music will make you act a certain way. And you say all these kids and they're, oh, they're ADD and we need to give them all these drugs. And we need Probably if you change the music they listen to, you'd see a dramatic difference, you know. But what I found was, we were strict on that, but then we started watching, letting them watch a lot of movies, all right? And we found out, hey, that, that bad music is in the movies. And so what we would do is when it got to that, we would start muting it, you know? All right, mute it, but we might miss something they're saying. No, it doesn't matter. We're going to mute that. We don't want to listen to that stuff, okay? It gets in your head and it starts, and, and it seemed kind of, you know, weird. Kids got a little bit older. We started dropping our guard a little bit, and we started, like, leaving it on. All right, we'll hope this scene goes by pretty quick, but you know, 80s rock and roll, I mean, stuff that I grew up with, so then I'm singing it the rest of the day, right? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, and so, so you say, well, well, how did that affect them? Well, you know what? Now they're going around singing some of those songs. <laughs> Where'd you learn that song? Oh, it's on that one movie that we watched. Well, it's just like, it's just like letting them listen to that music all day, right? And you say, well, you're being kind of, you're being kind of strict. No, no, no. These things affect us and we need to try to work on getting a higher standard for these things, okay? Uh, I'll skip a couple things here. We can't let down our guard in what we tolerate as a church, okay? I'll try to be quick on this. Look at Titus chapter 3, okay? One of the things that we can't tolerate in, uh, we, we can't tolerate in a church, and, and you know, uh, I struggle again. Sometimes thinking, man, I just want, I want to see, uh, I don't want confrontation. I don't want uh, people being upset. I don't want, uh, uh, I certainly don't want people leaving the church. And, uh, and I w- I'd love to see more people come and all these things. And it would be real easy for me to just say, you know what, forget it. We're not going to be, we're not, we're going to be real loose on this. We're not going to be so strict over here. And, uh, and maybe that would help get us some more people. Well, remember, worship, fellowship, discipleship, that's what the goal is, okay? The goal is not just let's see how many people we can put in these pews. And so we've got to uh, remember that and not get distracted by what we want or what we think should be done. As a church, the Bible has put certain, especially on our leaders, particularly on, our, on the leaders of the church, he's put some specific qualifications and expectations on us. And we can't just start letting lead, the leaders of the church be allowed to get away with certain things. And so there's, a, there's some very uh, strict qualifications on there as far as the pastor and the deacon and what have you. So Titus chapter 3, there are also certain lines uh, that we cannot allow people to cross in the church. One would be heresy. Now, these things that I'm about to preach, I don't think we have any problem with these, okay? I don't think there's anything, uh, but I feel like we need, this is a good time to just kind of brush up, maybe pre- preventative maintenance, who knows? Uh, but there's some things we can't tolerate. Look at Titus 3, chapter 10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Okay, there are people that every church I've ever been in, there are people that get in, and they start, they start teaching heresy, and, uh, and, some, and some pretty bad things start getting taught that are contrary to what, uh, what the Bible says. And when we find those out, we've got to try to talk to that person. And if, uh, and if that doesn't help, the Bible says we are to reject them, okay? 1 John chapter 1. We've read this before. I, I, may, I, don't, wanna, you know, I don't think we can read it too many times, uh, but these are some things I think we need to refresh her on here. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10.
First John 1.10. Uh, no, that's not it. What is it? Second John. If there come any unto you, Second John chapter, uh, there's only one chapter, verse 10. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine that we're talking about, about Christ, uh, in other words, he's bringing, an, he's bringing a gospel other than the one that, we, that you've received. Uh, if he comes in and preaches another gospel, it says, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. Uh, you know, that means to actually say, you know, you get like a, a Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, somebody knocks on your door and, and they're preaching. Now look, just because somebody's, a, I saw somebody earlier on their license plate said, I'm, I'm, I almost said LSD, I'm LDS. <laughs> it said, I'm LDS or whatever. And I thought, you know what? I don't dislike somebody because they're, they are Jehovah's Witness or they're Mormon or something like that. I don't like that. I want them to hear the gospel. I want them to hear, hear the truth. Uh, but there are people out there that are teaching it, and they're going door to door, and they're teaching it. And uh, and I remember somebody came and knocked on our door, and I, all I could, all I could do is I was burdened for my neighbors, and I thought, and I didn't do this, so I, I feel kind of bad about even mentioning this. But I remember thinking, I just want to go follow them, and go, every after they leave my neighbors, can I tell you the truth? Because that person was lying to you. <laughs> you know, can I tell you the truth? And it's not that I hate that person. I want them to, 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 to be right. But if you allow somebody to do that, you say, oh, God bless you, you know. Or as I heard somebody say, uh, I don't even say goodbye because the word goodbye means like uh, uh, God be with you or something. It's like a shortened form of God be with you or whatever. He says, I don't even say goodbye to them. And that sounds so harsh. But what he's saying is don't help somebody spread heresy. And it gets real easy in our, in our churches to get this uh, non-denominational atmosphere where you're like, well, I know you believe differently than I do, but come in, we'll just, we'll still, uh, we're under the umbrella of Christianity, so we'll worship together. And we'll, uh, you got to be careful because there's some damnable heresy being taught and we can't allow it to be spread. We can't, if we do, uh, let's look at what the verse says here. It says, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. I don't want to be a partaker of heresy being spread through the church, so we've got to be careful not to let our guard down when it comes to heresy. Uh, then we have to make sure as a church, again, I don't think we're going through any of this, and so I'm not saying this for uh, other than, than just I feel like that's what the Lord would have me to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter five. There are certain times a person lives in an open and outwardly obvious and damaging sinful life, and they're living in this. And the Bible tells us that we are not supposed to uh, to accept that. First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped to the next one. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 14 in a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetors or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you go out of the world. I know everybody probably understands this, but I'll explain it again. Uh, it's saying that you can expect the world outside the church to live this way. I'm not telling you, hey, don't go witness to them. Don't, you know, if you work with somebody that way, oh, don't quit your job because they're living that way. They're the world. You can expect these things out of the world. But, if a, but now I have written unto you, verse 11, uh, unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous uh, or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, which would be like a false accuser, uh, a fornicator, no, let's see, where am I? Or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So, uh, you know, you might wonder, well, where exactly are those lines to be drawn? Uh, and I believe that's, that's up to the church uh, to decide to some degree. But 
there is a line you can see that can be crossed where somebody, you know, you've talked to them, you've, 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 you've confronted them with the open sin that they're living that's, that's, that's setting a bad example for the whole community to see, hey, that person goes to that church. Oh, they don't live any differently than I do, so there uh, must not be anything wrong with doing that. No, we need to keep the church clean, and if people are, 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 they are um, involved in these things and they won't repent of that, we need to say, look, you're not welcome in here. At some point, that needs to be done. Now, somebody that's just learning the gospel, someone that's a brand new Christian and we're still teaching them these things, we've got to have a little bit of leniency, yes. But somebody that comes in and you've preached and you've preached and they don't care, you've confronted them with the sin and they, and they say, yeah, I know I shouldn't do that. And they keep doing that and you say, well, are people like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All over. You know, They'll pretty much say, well, maybe that's what the Bible says, but I'm not going to. You know, I'm not going to change. No, then that something that needs to be dealt with. Okay, uh, and then here is First Corinthians chapter 14. Something that can't be dealt with in the house of God is the lack of the proper order and respect in the house of God. First Corinthians chapter 14, 26 through 40. Now, how far to go on this? You know, I was going to one one of these days we'll preach this series. I was going to preach this series on uh, uh, the church uh, and the church house and 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 how to how to conduct ourselves in the house of God and all that stuff, and uh, and I'm, I'll kind of put that off for a little bit, but uh, but how far to go on that? We just had vacation Bible school. We had kids jumping around. We had kids opening up their chips after I told them not to and eating their chips while we're here, and and I could freak out and be like, oh, this is the house of God. Get that off. But really, this is just a building, all right? It's just a building. The church is the house of God, all right? Uh, when we meet together, we're the church. We understand that. But there's a certain amount of respect that should be given in the house of God. And, and, uh, uh, and, the, and even the building, okay? Because this is the place that we meet. You know, so I think, well, should I have stuff like that on the platform? Should I, should I put that? <laughs> Ordinarily, I would not put a rainbow up in, the, in, in a church, but, but we know what it represented as we're teaching the ark. And so what, what should I do all that? And so there's sometimes a wrestling of how much, uh, how much um, uh, should, we, should we not allow in, in the house of God. But here's what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 26. Now, uh, yeah, let's just start at 26 and read down. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you have a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. All right, our purpose of meeting here in the church is to edify, to leave this place having learned something and to, grow, and to have grown Okay, but uh, but what what Paul was seeing, and that's not going to apply exactly to churches in our day and age, but maybe it, maybe it does. Uh, but what we see here is uh, he was seeing all these weird and things that were uh, out of order in the church. He says, if many any man speak in an unknown tongue, somebody comes in here and they're speaking a different language, they get up, they're speaking uh, uh, Spanish or they're speaking uh, uh, French or something like that, and they get up here. Uh, and he says, if they're speaking unknown to him, let it be by two, or at least, or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So there's nothing wrong with being in a church where somebody's speaking a different language as long as there's an interpreter next to him. Now, we never, we'll never see this in our church, Lord, Lord willing, but there are churches all over this country that somebody will just stand up in the middle of the service and start going, just some kind of weird tongue. And, uh, and everybody will say, oh, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. No, according to the Bible, he's out of order. <laughs> what he's doing is confusion, all right? And, and if it's not edifying, then it's not doing anybody any good. It's just drawing attention to themselves, all right? He says, uh, let it be, uh, uh, let's, verse 28, but if there be no interpreters, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let him first hold his peace. In other words, wait your turn till you're called upon to say something. And, and uh, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. You know, we've been to conferences where one preacher gets up and then he sits down and, and they'll sing a song or something. And the next preacher will get up or whatever. But what if everybody just starts saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm challenging you on what you just said. And that, that would be just chaos, right? 
uh, and the spirits and the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And, uh, and this verse is not popular in our day and age, but it says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but that they are commanded to be under obedience, uh, as also saith the law. I'm not going to dwell on that. We've talked about that in other, uh, other messages. And if, they're, if, they be, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for the woman to speak in the church. Again, I've talked about this before. That doesn't mean a woman can't ever say anything in the church, uh, but there's an order, okay? A woman shouldn't be leading the church, and that's all throughout the Scripture. And uh, I remember uh, when I first got here and I was working with the youth, I didn't realize how many women pastors we had in Iola. There's a lot of women pastors. And, uh, and I was preaching this in Sunday school, and a kid from a Methodist church had just started coming. And I don't remember why we were talking, what we were on and why we were using that, but I said, you know, it's like this. I said, a woman can't be a pastor. He said, yes, they can. I said, well, no, they, the Bible says they can't be. I go to a church where the woman's a pastor. I said, well, they can be a pastor, but according to the Bible, they're not supposed to, <laughs> right? He said, whoa, I never heard that before. And, uh, and anyway, so I don't know where that came from, but that, that's, that's true. That's what the Bible says. And uh, the, the elder must be the hus husband of one wife. I don't think that that means that the woman ought to be. You know. Anyway, there's a, there's a lot of scriptures we can go to, but, but there's a reason. God wants the men to step up and be the leaders of the church. What came the word of God out from you or came it out, uh, uh, I mean, came out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anybody be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Uh, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and for, forbid not the speaking with tongues, of course, with interpreters and all that. Let all things be done decently and in order. So uh, we got to put, keep our guard up in this way, too. We can't just let church become a free-for-all where somebody says, well, I want to get up there and I want to share something or I want to get up there and I want to sing a song and there's no like uh, requirements or, or qualifications or prerequisites. There has to be some, some decency and some order in all things. We can't drop our guard on that. Okay. But you might say, I'm tired of the fight. You know, this is why people drop their guard, right? They're fighting, they're in a fight, and they just get tired after a while. I'm tired of the fight. So they drop their guard and leave themselves right, right open. I'm tired of the fight. You know, we've been doing these things as independent Baptists for a long time, and look where it's gotten us, and we're not, you know, we're not making the progress that we should be making, and so we just need to quit. Uh, just got to drop that guard. Uh, we need to just, uh, uh, you know, wouldn't it be easier just drop our guard and just let things go the way they go. Yeah, if you want your lights to be punched out, <laughs> right? Just drop your guard. Because that's what's happening in churches all over this world. They drop their guard. Well, maybe if we do this, we get a few more people in here. Maybe if we do this, you know, we'll... and they're hardly recognized as churches anymore. And here's what the Bible says in the book of Revelation, and then I'm closing. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, uh, he's writing to the seven uh, churches there in Ephesus. And, uh, and the Lord says this, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Well, that's a, uh, you know, how do you know who's evil? You've got to use a little bit of judgment there, but you're not supposed to judge. But yeah, the Bible says that you're supposed to recognize evil. Canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because thou left thy first love. He said, you're doing all these things good. Now, if I have to guess what it means to lose your first love, here's what I think it means. Well, what I said at the very beginning, we can't drop our guard when it comes to what is our mission? What are we supposed to be doing? Worshiping God, you know, reaching people, 
uh, discipling, having fellowship with our, with our fellow believers and encouraging one another and all that. If you lose that, oh, but at least you hate evil. Yeah, well, what's your part? What, you know, what are you accomplishing? You're just hating evil. That's all you're doing, right? Or you say, oh, I, I'm, I'm doing that, but uh, uh, I know I'm not winning souls and all that stuff, but I've got my guard up. Yeah, you're just being used as a punching bag then, right? He says, I know, but you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Uh, so, but oh, what I want to notice there is that God will remove your candlestick. I, I was jokingly saying, you know, if you drop your guard, you'll punch your lights out. But if we're not careful, God will put the lights out of a church. And there's no more light. You know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. No, there's sometimes where I don't know what the church is shining, but it's not the light of Jesus. <laughs> you know, and so we've got to be careful that our light's not put out. But if we endure and we give it all to God, then I want to go back to our text real quick because it said, yes, be sober. It said, be vigilant. It said, resist steadfast. These are all things that we are, it's our responsibility to try to do. And at some point we, re, we get to the point where we realize, but wait a minute, that's so hard. I just, I can't do that. I can't make that stand. I can't keep doing that. I can't endure. But the Bible says this, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, right, we've done all that we can and given it to the Lord, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. See, it's not about us. It's not about my standards. It's not about what I can do or what I, uh, what I can guard against or whatever. What it really comes down to is we're just by faith saying, I need God to fight this fight for me. And what we're enduring, enduring in is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you.